while the ushers will be picking up the cups. <coughs> Let's take our Bibles <coughs> and turn with me, if you would, to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. <coughs> <clears throat> Luke 9, and at the end of the chapter, the last five or six verses are the verses I want to read to you and ask you to keep your Bibles open to that passage. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. <clears throat> Some uh, Bibles will put paragraph headings in. They're not in the original text, but they're helpful to um, introduce the subject of that paragraph. And mine, I notice, says exacting discipleship. The requirements that Jesus makes for being a disciple. We'll begin our reading in 57 <clears throat> and read through uh, 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I think we could give a title to this passage of Scripture. It would be Disqualified Disciples. <clears throat> we know that not everyone that began to follow Jesus followed through. We know that not everyone who followed him, at least outwardly, <clears throat> was a genuine disciple. And that's not to say that they were deliberate, you know, scheming, fiendish hellions of some kind. But there are a lot of reasons why we can be maybe convinced in our own mind that we are a disciple, but we can be disqualified if there are certain characteristics, character traits, or conduct that Jesus would look upon and say, that doesn't fit my description of a disciple. Now, there's the reason to look at that is that we don't fall into those. It's not that these people who may have been disqualified here remain disqualified forever. God's in the business of pointing out pitfalls to us so we don't fall into them. We can avoid them, but we have to know them. So as Jesus is talking to these three different people, I think there's really a lot here um, that we can see has to do with Jesus' requirements for discipleship, and we learn an awful lot by what Jesus says to these people about what disqualified them or what he saw in them that he knew had to be corrected. If we look first <clears throat> at 57 and actually 57 through, yeah, 57, 58. Just look at that again. They were going along the road. Someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now that's a broad commitment. I'll follow you wherever you go. 
And then Jesus answered. Now, we get a lot from what, how Jesus answers these people because, remember, he knew what was in their hearts. He knew what was in their minds. He knew all their circumstances. So when Jesus says to them such and such, we know that he has a view we can't have. And he goes to the core of where they're really at. And he simply says, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but I don't have any place to even lay my head. Now, what's a disqualifying characteristic of this disciple? Or wannabe disciple? It is presumption. First of all, he was presumptive. Presumption in signing up to follow Jesus is a disqualifying trait. Eventually, you will wash out. What is presumption? Presumption, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's something like this. Presumption is to enter any project or endeavor of any kind, any commitment of any kind, with an exaggerated, overestimated view of my abilities to carry that commitment out. And second, with a badly underestimated grasp of the cost and the difficulties and the requirements. Does that make sense? I will follow you wherever you go. Well, this man didn't know. Jesus did. That would involve Calvary. I'll go wherever you, Jesus, I'll serve you no matter what. Really? Now, Jesus isn't being hard on him. He loved him. He loves us all. And he never is seeking in pointing out where we are flawed to destroy us with it. It's to correct us. But there's something about this man also who there's really two issues. Number one is he had a completely exaggerated view of his own power and his own ability. Basically, he's going to be a Christian on his own strength. And second, we know from Jesus' answer to him, somehow Jesus also knew he expected, this man expected there would be some benefit, some advantage to being a Christian. If I follow you, and, and I don't blame him for that. The disciples thought that. Peter thought that. Peter was sure. Peter, James, and John always got to be the three that went someplace with Jesus when the other nine disciples were left outside. James and John went to Jesus, got, got their mom <laughs> to go to Jesus and say, let my, two, you know, let my two little boys sit on one side and the one on the other side of your throne when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus asked them, he said, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? What did they say? Yes, we are. Jesus wasn't angry at them. He didn't chew on them. He didn't cut them short. But I, he said, really? Are you sure? Because they had no idea what that meant. I cannot follow Jesus on my own strength. I can't just decide. Now, there is a decision involved in obeying God, but... It has to be a spirit-aided decision. And only when I am renewed by the Holy Spirit in the new birth, when I'm born again, can I be a disciple through Christ's strength, not my own. This is a man that just decides. Christianity is a good idea. It is nice to be nice. It's nice to get out of different you know, slaveries and bondages and addictions and habits, and it would just be better if I shaped up. So, I'm going to do it. Every one of us made those kind of resolutions, but we can't keep them. 
I mentioned last week that God often, I believe, sits back, not unkindly at all, but he sits back and he watches me try to do that so that I will learn from my inevitable failure. We'll always fail in trying to be something that I don't have in here. Now, I've got to be really careful here. Um, I have a grandson, and um, he's playing Little League. Um, and I don't want uh, any of this to get to him, okay? <laughs> but walking and chewing gum at the same time are quite an endeavor, okay? Um, he has good equipment, and he's got coaches that I think care, and they're doing their best. But you can watch that field of 10-year-olds, and whatever it is, three or four of them have it, okay? And um, probably the majority of them don't have it. Some have a little bit of it, and it might be, you might be able to shine it up a little bit, but the bulk of them it's actually, let's, let me put it this way. Liz and I and Bethany are not waiting until Cameron signs a major league contract <laughs> um, to pick out our home in, you know, our second home, okay? Um, I don't think that's going to happen. <coughs> Being a Christian on your own is kind of like that. You just don't have it. Because the life of Jesus is not vibrant in here. And he lives through me. I can't be a Christian on my own. I watched a pathetic thing the other day. It's sad to me. Um, and I'm in favor, obviously, of every single technological advance that we can come up with to help people who have had spinal injuries. And, you know, they've been working on, I think they call it... Um, Exo something. It's outward robotic um, equipment that makes, can, you know, it, it, it's walking. And so they had a person who paralyzed from the waist down, and they had all this equipment on, and they were saying that this person walked. I'm grateful that they can be mobile in any way, and I, I thank God for that. But they're not walking. There's nothing there. It's external. It is not from within. That's what it's like to try to be a Christian without the new birth. Just saying... I'll do it. Can't do it. And Jesus also reminded this man and us that if I go on presumption only, on, on my own strength, I'll do it. There will be costs come along that I'm not counting on that will erode that kind of a commitment. The kind of commitment I make with my own will, I can't keep when the heat's on. When the storm waves are buffeting me. I've got to have Jesus in here to make it. There's a second person. There's a little bit of difference here. You notice that the first man volunteered. There's no evidence Jesus called him. Um, but he had to be hanging around and knowing what was going on. Also, by the way, Matthew 8 is the another place, another gospel that includes something similar to this, only there are two men there. And this same man is called a scribe. It means he knew everything. He knew scripture. He knew about church. And he was involved. I'll tell you what it reminds me. And then I'll move on to the second man. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel had a vision of a valley filled with scattered, very dry bones, skeleton, not even connected. And God spoke to Ezekiel and said, this vision you see, says, this is the house of Israel. 
they're so dead spiritually, they've been dead so long that their bones are scattered, there's not anything left of them. And he says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel made the greatest statement in answering that, that you and I can. Oh, Lord, only you know. Ezekiel watched and it said he heard a sound of bones coming together as they should be aligned. And the bones began to come together. And then it says ligaments and tendons came upon them. And muscles came upon them. And then it says they were covered with flesh. They were people again. But I love this little statement. It says the bones came together, the flesh came upon them, period. Then there's the next sentence, just a few words. But there was no breath in them. That's what we can be in the church. We can have everything arranged like it ought to look. And we have muscles and tendons and skeleton and skin over us. And we are recognizable, but there's no breath in us. That's, what, that's the difference between being just maybe a church member, a hanger on and a Christian Jesus lives in here God spoke to Ezekiel and he says preach to them preach to them the word tell them what I'm telling them you relay it to them and it says as he preached to them the breath of God entered in them they stood upon their feet a mighty army for God. What could God do with a spiritual army if everyone calling themselves a Christian had breath in them? Does that make sense? This dear man, and we don't have any record that he ended up in hell. Jesus corrected him. But he was trying to go on presumption. Presumption will ultimately disqualify us. Second, Jesus called this man. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now, if you look at this answer you it's amazing you look at it and you think my land jesus how in the world how could you be so unfeeling and cold and cruel to say something like that could i go to my dad's funeral no well that's not what he's saying this man's father wasn't dead he was old infirm going to die maybe they thought soon but no one knows for sure and Jesus also we have to remember this when Jesus said to this man you follow me remember when Jesus says anything to us I don't care what it is whatever he says to us he knows our state our circumstances he knows everything about us already and then we come up with an excuse. Well, now, Lord, you don't realize. Yeah, he does realize. He happens to know about it. We just sang this morning. Do we, can we teach the one who knows all things? Everything. There's not the slightest detail that he isn't fully aware of. Jesus knew this guy's heart. And he knew that he was using <coughs> the excuse of taking care of his father, taking care of his family. And this is really, technically, this man, I think, is a little closer to being called to the ministry. He said, you go preach. Well, you don't realize, Lord, I got to do this, I got to do that. 
And when I get done with that, when I get everything in order, then I'll do what you tell me to do. There's a broader principle then that when Jesus tells me to do something, I have to do it and do it immediately. We pray. It's been a while since we prayed the Lord's Prayer. That's not necessarily good. But what do we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in heaven, the Father says to the angels, go do this, go serve that Christian. Go take this message. Go minister to that person. Watch over that child. And in heaven, they say, well, okay, I'll do it. But you're going to have to wait because I've got a couple other things and I've got to get this in order and got to get that in order. And then when I get that in order, I'll, I'll go do it. Do you think that happens? <laughs> no. Jesus already knows my circumstances. If he says, listen, you do this or you don't do that or whatever he tells me in my heart clearly, I can do it or he wouldn't tell me. He never requires something of me that I can't do. When he just says, listen, I talk to people a lot and obviously I have a walk with God that I've got to guard. We're all in this together. People say, I'll say, What's, what does it seem like God's telling you to do? Well, he's, he just seemed to tell me everywhere I read in my Bible and it just seemed like songs I heard on Christian radio was, just trust me, just trust me, just trust me. And I, and I what do I do? <laughs> well, how about if you just trust him? You understand? But I got to do something. Just trust him. If that's what he said, do it. A great text, a tremendous text for a sermon is what Mary, the mother of Jesus, said to the servants at the wedding in Cana. She just said to the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Do it. I can, because he gives me the grace to do it. So he said, you follow me. Then he got reasons from this guy why he couldn't. And in this case, again, Jesus knew that the, this was a, an unjustified excuse. Well, I, I got to take care of my parents. Now, uh, remember, if Jesus knew he was an only child and he knew, you know, whatever, um, that this was impossible, he would never have asked him in the first place. Does Jesus care about our duty to our parents? Of course. What was the last thing, nearly the last thing Jesus said as he hung from the cross? He looked and saw his mother and John the apostle standing next to her. And he said to John, Behold your mother. And to his mother, Behold your son. Meaning, he gave John, as one of the last things he did, responsibility to care for his mother and told his mother, you rely on him and you, and it says from that day forward, I think the King James might even say from that hour forward, it says he took her into his house. So what was John doing? Lord Jesus, as soon as I get this done and we get the yard put in and we finish that added on in the house... And, you know, and I, you know, I got three more years of work, and then I'll retire, and, and then I'll do it. He did it that hour. Here's a second characteristic that will disqualify us. Procrastination. The putting off of what we know we have to do. Now, people do that with the decision to mind God become a Christian, to get saved. Listen, there are 10,000 things that come in our way, and whenever we start, I can't tell you the number of people. I really can't. As soon as we get through, it, it doesn't matter whether it's sports or work or a thousand things. You know, 
we're going to be at church. My wife and I talk, and we're going to be at church. Once we get past, to just fill in the blank. I don't care what you put in there. Once we get past that, you'll see us. I'm a wonderful human being. So I smile, and I say, well, good. And I'm thinking, I'll never see you again, okay? <laughs> unfortunately, really unfortunately, I'm way too often right. If you will put this, whatever it is, in front of obeying God now, something else will come up when you do get this taken care of. Something else will be there. There's always something else. As soon as I get out of this financial hole I'm in, I'm going to start tithing. There's one of a thousand. Procrastination will disqualify us. <clears throat> Finally, another also said, now this guy was volunteering again. And on the surface, he seems like the man just in front of him. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now this again sounds, I can't believe this, that Jesus would say, don't even go home and tell your wife and your kids goodbye. They don't know where you're at. They've got a missing person's report out on you, and you're not to, you follow me or else. He's not saying that at all. The Greek word is really extensive here. It means bid them farewell is what some other the King James says. It means to go home, to go back to the farm, the estate, or whatever the case might be. And set in order all of the household affairs. Give the servants their directions with an aim of continuing to manage from afar. This is not somebody who is really leaving all to follow Jesus. He is still keeping track of everything that goes on back there. He is, this is preoccupied. Preoccupation will disqualify you as a disciple. This is someone who is not giving full attention to the present command for looking back. And I, I want you to notice something here. It doesn't say that he went back. He looked. There's a reference here, I think, to Lot's wife. Remember, Jesus said, he said, remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Now, look back, what does that mean? I can't even check the rearview mirror. He's not saying that. He's saying look back with a longing and a hankering to go back. Looking back leads to going back. Okay? That tells us it's interesting to read all kinds of different commentators from different centuries even and different theological positions. All of them said this is a person with divided loyalty, a divided heart, a double heart. This is the person who is following Jesus but just like the disciples, still highly influenced and interested in and fixed upon this world and their career, and their future. This is someone preoccupied. I'll never make it as a Christian if I stay preoccupied with something else. I'm half-hearted. Can't do it. There's where God calls every single believer to a deeper and distinct, thorough work in my heart in which he cleanses me from this innate interest in me and myself and my future and my agenda and my ambition. And really, if I follow this out very far, and you can see it in the lives of the disciples before the day of Pentecost, 
The truth of the matter is there was a pretty good streak in them of Jesus needs to serve them. And that's really what's still there. It is self-crowning. It's a form of self-sovereignty. That has to die. I have to take, take off that supposed crown and say, Lord, you rule and you reign and you do whatever you want with me, no matter what, thy will be done. No qualifications, no little parts walled off somewhere. I have a good friend I went to seminary with and still see him a lot, and he's a professor in seminary or at a Christian liberal arts out in Oregon. And he and I were in seminary together, and he was, I pastored a little student pastor, and he pastored a little student pastor. And <clears throat> the parsonage, um, in his case, and of course in mine, was owned by the church. I didn't own it. He didn't, Mark didn't own that house. Well, the previous pastor had lived in it. The church owned it. The previous pastor had lived in it for I don't know how many years, and he moved out. <clears throat> He took one bedroom upstairs, bored a hole in the door, put a new, you know, Yale lock deadbolt thing in it, kept the key to himself. Mark's living in this house, and he doesn't even know what's in that room, and he doesn't have the key to it. And the church doesn't have a key to it. Now, we knew the guy that had went and gone before, and so our joke was that, well, he's locked up his sermons. <coughs> because they're so valuable that they'll be stolen and published and they'll make a million dollars. Uh, you'd have had to know who he was. Anyway, he, Mark lived there several years, never got in that room, never got a key, never knew what was in there. Our hearts are like that. When we haven't given Jesus the key, the deed, the whole business, the disciples were like that until the day of Pentecost when God burned that interest, excessive interest in self, out. It's the only way to live. Preoccupation, divided loyalty will disqualify us. Now, the only reason God points it out in what appears to be difficult and as this my Bible says, exacting discipleship. It may seem hard, but listen, it's the only way to live, it's the only way to make it to heaven. And the rewards are beyond description. May we be thorough disciples. Doesn't matter what he calls me to do. Be a full-hearted disciple. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to ask Dan to come and dismiss us with prayer. Father in heaven, I know.